everyone, and welcome to episode 694 of the Long Box Heroes, the Lamborghini of Comic Book Podcasts. I'm Todd, along with Joe. How are we doing today, Joe? Todd, are we making it to 300 or uh, 1,000? Uh, we're definitely making it to 700. Okay. And then we'll see who's sitting in the chairs at 1,000. Oh, boy. Well... You'll listen after dark this week in regards to my wishes in the event of, or Todd's wishes in the event of his untimely passing. So mm-hmm. the show will go on forever. Right, and yeah, forever. we're gonna have the our hearts will go on song in the background. Tell me a lie, <laughs> all the songs when people tell me really... sweet little lies. Yes, yes, right. But would you like to know what's on this short show this week, Joe? Oh, well, you jinxed it now. But yes, I do want to know what's going on this week. Uh, In news, uh, more creators added to Jason Aaron's TMNT. um, And rated M for Marvel, Joe? Who? What? (laughs) Uh, The return of the Rob Watch. Uh, You know, fan favorite segment. Um, Conventions. Uh, the latest edition of My Walk Down Lois Lane by our good friend Becky, which is more of one street over from Lois Lane this week, but you'll see when we get there. It's like a junction, if you will. Yeah, maybe the corner of, if you will. There you go. Um, at least parallel. Um, what we read last week, which was Rogues number one, Cobra Commander number one, and Avengers Twilight number one. That's the triple threat one right there, Joe. Mm -hmm. Uh, What we're looking forward to this week, Todd and Joe have issues where we reread Gail Simone's Secret Six in its entirety. So it's Villains United number four. Um, And then I don't think I have any heart attacks and there's no TV talk or movie talk. So like I said, uh, quick 15 minutes, maybe. Everybody's pulled everything from their TV and movie schedules. Um, you know, they talk, you, still people talk to this day about Batman 89. Oh. People to be talking about Madam Web 24. 24 <laughs> 7. Yes. We'll be talking about Madam Web 24, 24 7. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, we did get some additional information in regards to uh, the Jason Aaron relaunch over at IDW of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Um, They did say that the first four issues will have the art talents of Raphael Albuquerque, Joel Jones, Cliff Chang, and Chris Burnham. Um, So I guess the plan is that each one of these will draw one of the first four issues, each focusing on an individual turtle. Right. Right. Which I think is a good way to kind of get a foothold for the new uh, creative team of Jason Aaron as the writer in there. But I also think that this is a good way to keep the book on schedule. Right. Um, and it's uh, and it's a time-tested thing with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all the way back to the original run. I think in the first, I don't know, maybe dozen issues or so, along the way, everybody got their own one-shot, like mm-hmm. the, the Turtles. So, And then even when the new IDW run came, they kind of did that. Everybody seemed to get their own one-shot so you can get to know the character. So I kind of like that idea. Right, but it's also a good way, you know, there's a book – launches the you know the the first issue is june the number one is july we're january now uh if we can get a bunch of issues in the can then we never have to worry about the book being late right i say just use a bunch of anchors more on that later (laughs) um and i so i'm excited these are great big name uh creative types but between me and you if this book was drawn by me and you, I'm still getting it because I'm like Jason Aaron, right? I wouldn't because then I would know the whole plot. I would give up the job. <laughs> um, but no, I'm with you. I mean, this was this was Turtles, Jason Aaron, sight unseen, put it on my list. So yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that this is a similar situation, but whenever something like this happens, when I see things kind of being told to us this far in advance, it reminds me back to kevin smith's green arrow run ah okay uh so kevin smith's first comic book work for one of the big two companies was the run on daredevil under the marvel knights banner kind of revitalized daredevil kind of revitalized marvel at the time 
And I think like the first three or four issues came out on time. And mm-hmm. then the next three or four or five came out kind of late. It happens. I remember. Oh, go ahead. No, I was thinking. Of the no, green, go ahead. Go ahead. Green Arrow being late. That was Scott Beatty who did the fill-ins. Well, no. So Green Arrow. Um, it was famously because, again, I was a big, you know, much bigger Kevin Smith guy then than I am now. Mm-hmm. But I remember Kevin Smith saying that when he pitched Green Arrow and DC approved it, they said, we are not soliciting issue one until you've turned in the first nine scripts. Okay. <laughs> so they could make sure that this book would not fall behind. But at least it didn't fall behind. It did end up falling behind, but... Um, at least not for the first nine issues and not for Kevin Smith's fault. Right. And speaking of that, I think, uh, onomatopoeia is coming back. I saw that somewhere. Oh, really? Yeah. I was reading something and onomatopoeia showed up and I was like, give Kevin Smith that check boy. Yeah, baby. There you go. I, I would not doubt onomatopoeia being in the James Gunn cinematic DC universe. Ooh. Wasn't like. The only other key onomatopoeia appearance was the Walt Flanagan and Brian Johnson, like Kevin Smith, like lackeys Batman book that Kevin Smith did. I, I didn't read it, so I would uh-huh. take your, your word for it. The but... Widening Geyer. Oh, yeah, you, that might have been, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I, it's one of those things where, like, I want to save it for the end of the show, but I... Uh, so... I'm going to save it for the end of the show. I'm making a note for myself. I'm just You'll writing forget. down. You'll no, forget. I'm writing down five letters. I'm going to remind myself because I'm pretending that people tune out at the end of the show because I don't want to mention it here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, speaking of which, also in the news, Marvel, not to be outdone, um, advance, uh, announcing th- stuff well in advance. We still haven't gotten the full... Uh, April solicitations from all the publishers yet, even though the previews catalog is going to be out next week. But Marvel is already teasing stuff for May, and they are teasing the Jed McKay, Pepe Larraz Blood Hunt crossover event. Right. Uh, five issue miniseries, tie ins, spin offs, etc., etc., deals with vampire stuff, uh, deals with the Avengers and Doctor Strange. Uh, Jed McKay is writing Avengers and Doctor Strange and Moon Knight currently. I like his Avengers. I haven't tried his other stuff. But what makes this miniseries special, Todd, Mm -hmm. is that you could buy the regular edition of the the main miniseries, I assume, or you could buy the Red Band editions, which will be rated M. They'll have additional story pages and graphic art too explicit for the regular pages. Too extreme. Oh, so I'm kind of shocked that it took Marvel this long to try something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, to sell, like, and not to say that they haven't done stuff where it it's ex- graphic. It's graphic, right? You know, uh, just as an example, like. They'll do, um, you know, an M.A. book or the Marvel zombie stuff. But because it's like all monsters, like mm-hmm. eh, it kind of gets away with it. Right. But to have it be like part of the mainline continuity, I'm shocked that this is the first time that they're doing like two different versions. Like, oh, here's the G rated version mm-hmm. and here's the more mature rated version, but like mature for like violence. And like, what's the line with violence before we get into like gratuitous nudity in a Marvel book, or is it never getting that far? Well, well, we'll get there in a second, but um, I think it's from the bit recently where there was the predator Wolverine crossover Mm -hmm. now, which I don't think is in continuity, but it doesn't matter. But I think that sold very well. And at a ridiculous like seven ninety nine price tag or something like that. But I looked through that. That was brutal. Yeah. So if that sold, then what does that tell the bean counters? You know what I mean? Like, well, we should have an option to sell more brutal comics to people because they want them. There's a market for it. So that's what it is. But I'll stand by this. Nudity is the is the 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 line. 
because I don't know how many times I I was in in the heyday of Marvels are not Marvel zombies, Walking Dead. Somebody would come in and the kid would be like, I want to buy this Walking Dead. And our retailer would be like, it's graphic. It's, you know, there's a lot of violence. I can't sell it to you because you're a minor. Like, I, he, not that he can't, but he like won't. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And it'd be like, your parent or guardian has to buy it. And with them, most of the time as a parent or guardian, and they'll be like, oh, is it is it graphic? Yeah, there's a lot of killing, gore. Is there any sex or nudity? Well, no. Well, let him have it. He watches tons of horror movies. Like, that's the Mendoza line. Like, you say there's sex in it? No, my, my kid can't have this. But you say, like, gore, like, people getting killed, brutal murder. That It's fine. Go ahead. And I've seen it 99%. There's the 1% that'll be like, all right, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe you shouldn't get this, Billy. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. for the most of the time, it's like, here's your comic. There's no sex or, n- or nudity, so I'm fine with it. <laughs> I'm trying to find what that um, Predator Wolverine book was rated. Right. And it makes me wonder how something like that, and then conversely, how something like this upcoming would work with the digital version of things, right? If you get Oh, yeah, di- that's true. I didn't think about that. Yeah, if you get the digital, like, obviously, you know, I can't. Uh, buy this from any discerning retailer who's worth their salt and actually respects things, what have you, right? Mm -hmm. But if I have the app that my family got me for Christmas, you know, I'm sure I could just go in there and futz around with the parental controls and read any any filth that Marvel publishes. Well, we have filth that (laughs) Marvel... The mouse, Joe, the mouse is going to be over that. Don't you worry. Uh, but no, I, I, I kind of set you up there. You know, of course, there's a, a definitely a double standard when it comes to mature content, violence versus nudity, sexual situations, things of that nature. And, you know, just the still to this day, some would argue Puritan society in which we all live. Yeah, I agree. Ask not for whom the Rob trolls. The Rob trolls for thee. One thing that you don't have to worry about the content of, and that would be the upcoming book from the Rob entitled Last Blood. And by that, I mean, you don't have to worry about it because it's apparently going to be very difficult to get. (laughs) Uh, So the Rob has stated that this is going to be a four issue miniseries with a spinoff. And it's going to be available this week only through the Rob's Whatnot stream. Now, it's still unclear if it's going to be this Wednesday or Thursday. It depends on when the Rob is going to have them in hand. Um, 28 pages, brand new art and story by the Rob. It'll have a preview of issue two. And the first rollout this week is going to be 50 signed copies Mm -hmm. and 50 unsigned copies. There are going to be various variant covers available with no time frame or date given on those. Uh, It's going to be a very interesting way. Like, you know, we we give the Rob a hard time and rightfully so. Um, But I don't know. This is kind of interesting the way he's rolling out this book. I I wonder, you know, I, I would say that Rob is probably, at least to my knowledge, the biggest creator who is on Whatnot. Probably. And I wonder if this is going to start a trend of other creators attempting to roll their stuff out on their social media selling whatever Mm -hmm. marketplace storefront and just doing these low end print runs before they start rolling out more and more versions of stuff. Like we have no idea how many variant covers is going to be. I don't know if you're familiar with the way that whatnot works. Um, a little bit. It's basically video eBay. Yeah. So it's video eBay, but it's like super fast. It's like, I'm going to put this issue of last blood signed up for one minute. Everybody bid. And mm-hmm. then everybody just bids as much as they want, as fast as they want in the minute. And when that minute is up, whoever has the highest bid gets that issue. Now, because um, uh, I was talking with uh, young Adam, your co-host, is this the one that like, if someone bids, in the last, I don't know, ten seconds, it'll add time to the 
to the uh, auction. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I so you, I think you can do that maybe on whatnot. Well, I think you. I think the seller could set something up like that. So there's not a definitive snipe where, like on eBay, with something, something's up for three, five, seven days. You put your bid in, and then somebody could come in at the literal last second and grab it. <laughs> Right. Well, this is like, oh, with one second, you're going to do it. Well, if this guy wants to up it and he wants, like, it's it's a good way to, you know, not limit in your cash flow. Yeah, I, I think there is something that's set up there that the last, it does give, you know, once the time is up, or whatever the, the seller is designated as a time and somebody gets their last bid in, as you mentioned through Adam, somebody puts that last bid in, it extends the time to give like a going once, going twice to everybody else. Right, which is I, I cool. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I've never bought anything off whatnot. So I don't know. I did watch a stream or two of it at one yeah. point because I forget who, who had something, who had a limited edition action figure that I wanted. And I was like, oh, well, I ended up getting it somewhere else, but this person was still going to sell it. So I watched it just to see how it would have worked. I was like, this is all beyond me. Uh, not beyond me, but not my thing. You know what I mean? It's too fast for me. I'm old and I like things slower. Yeah, so if it's Wednesday night, um, I might have it with a second eye on. If it's Thursday night, you know, I'm recording another show, so I won't be able to watch. But uh, right. It will sell out, man. Yeah, yeah it's only 100 copies, issues. Like, no no know? way, you know? Yeah. Uh, FOMO, Joe. Right, and the Rob's variant cover for Thundercats came out, and the story that it has 170,000 initial orders gets spin, that those are all because of the Rob. Definitely, no other reason. Um, I've fallen behind on doing Rob's recaps. You know what? I'm mad at you about that, but go ahead. So, Friday's episode was... Um, involving John Burns feuds in the world of comic books. Oh, well, what was it? A ten-hour podcast? Well, it's funny you say that, Todd, because in the last twelve months, he's done two other episodes about John Burns feuds in comics. Wow, that's <laughs> so, one guy who had a lot of bridges to burn, man. So I feel as though we might be covering a lot of um familiar ground. Let's say. Gotcha. Any milkshake place reviews? Uh, again, I didn't listen, so I don't know. I'm gonna guess not. But the other episode that came out today was, Todd, do you know the sordid past of Batman and Captain America? Uh, no, I don't. Do you know the sordid past of Captain America and Batman that at one time in the Golden Age, they used guns? I I know about that, yes. All right, well, that was the episode. Wow, that was the whole episode? <laughs> that's, that's what the selling point of it was. I'm sure the Rob will eventually get to the topic at hand. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I, I, you know, uh, self-imposed break from the Rob just because the topics of the show were like, yeah, we've been here with John Byrne twice in the last 12, like this will be the third time in 12 months that he's covered John Byrne's feuds. <laughs> I don't think it's over either. So <laughs> no, I don't think it's over, but I'm just saying, you know, I feel as though like we're going to, we're going to hit a lot of the same topics that we did. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll eventually get to them. It's a, other stuff took precedence is all. Let's say that. How about that? Okay, I don't understand what could, but I'll take yeah. your word for it. All right. uh, well, uh, one thing that the Rob won't be at this weekend is the Orlando Original Art Expo. Mm -hmm. Not so much as a comic book convention, but if you remember the last couple years or so, we would mention there was that one fancy art comic con in Italy. Lake Como. Lake Como, there you go. For the uh, big wallets, Joe. Right. So this is the Lake Como people bringing that convention to the United States. Yep. Um, taking place in beautiful Orlando. Uh, lots of big names, lots of heavy hitters, lots of folks that are local to the area um, and so forth. Uh, Sean Gordon Murphy, Mike and Laura Alred, the Kuberts are going to be there. Uh, Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor, Simon Bianchi. Adam Hughes, Dan Jurgen, Jose Garcia Lopez, uh, Matt Wagner, Dan Brereton, amongst many others. Right. And this is not like I think if I was looking at the site correctly, any sort of sketches or original pieces were done and ordered and to be fulfilled like six months ago. 
Yeah, but like there it, there was options, but I I guarantee they'll probably have options on site too. Mm-hmm. But these were as like I I would call them like the big boy purchases. You know yes. what I mean? Like like this is like you're getting an at home commission, and this is going to be make it what like these these PayPal payments are going to be what makes it worth going to to Lake Como of Florida. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, if you're a big spender, you got the folded money, the comma money, if you will. Mm-hmm. There's still time to make it to Orlando this weekend uh, for that big art show. It's a convention. Right. But I am so glad I retired from the art game, Joe. <laughs> oh, my God. I wanted to go down so bad. But, just to look? Know, just to look. You know, like, but then I worry I would buy. But my responsibilities here for the soon to be named network wouldn't would not allow me to go joe gotcha <laughs> well if you're interested of course we do have the link for that set up in the show notes for this episode along with information about soon to be named network at soon to be named network.com anytime any of the shows go live you could certainly find them at their own individual sites whatever podcatcher you use but of course you can find everything in one stop at soon to be named network.com, and that includes Longbox Heroes, Longbox Heroes After Dark, Puzzle Warriors 3, Profane Arguments, Porch Talk, Final Wrestling Place, We Need Wrestling, At Odds with Wrestling, Wings on Wings, and Haya Bussy. Mm-hmm. I got shamed last week for not naming off the, uh, the shows in the soon to be named network. Right. And I'm good for like once every three months and not naming all the shows. Right. I don't know. I hear, uh, you know, financial responsibilities may get in the way of porch talk in the near future. So, oh, you know, can't talk on the porch of the, the you know, where you work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you should show up. Oh, my God. You want to do a porch talk? I'm here to do a porch talk. Ugh. Get out of the way, sir. I'm here to talk to Adam. Uh, anyway, uh, be sure to check out some of the other stuff that our friends are up to in and around the internet as well. Uh, go check out our friend Mike Sterling's blog over at progressiveruin.com. Go check out our friend Kevin's blog at hellionsteam.com. Be sure to check out Rick Williams, the chop shop at free karate chops.storeenvy.com. Jason Sandberg's Jupiter is still available to purchase over at his Indiegogo, as well as Chris Runt's self published Battle Monsters, available over at Fortress of Comic News.com. Speaking of self published work, our good friend Davey of the band Cave People has his self published comics, Mending and Keeper, both available digitally. One is available in print, the other is sold out. I'll let you find out which one is which by heading over to cavedomaincomics.com. And if you do not have a comic book store in your area, or you do not have a good comic book store in your area, let our comic book store be your comic book store. Comics on the Green. Go over, check things out, find out when all the new releases are going to be in. Stuff ships on Tuesdays and Wednesdays now. This is just the world we live in. Uh, Sign up for the mailing list. Sign up for the mail order subscription service. Get your books mailed to you weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. And if you do, there's a chance that you can get a a sketch on the package from our good friend Becky, who we're going to turn things over to right now for her walk down Lois Lane. Welcome back to my walk down Lois Lane, but this week we're going to walk down a different path and I'm going to tell you about an iconic title and give you some fun facts that you can argue at your local comic shop. If I told you Timely, now Marvel, had a comic that had the first black character, one of the earliest annuals, four successful spin-offs, and was the first to feature the Marvel banner when they switched over, what comic would you think of? If you're saying anything other than Millie the Model, you're wrong. Millie the Model was 207 issues and ran from 1945 to 1973. Originally created by Ruth Atkinson, the book stars Millie Collins, her roommate Tony Turner, her rival and absolute savage, Chili Storm, Marvel's first black character, Jill Geralds, and Millie's boyfriend, Clicker, who all work at the Hanover Agency, and it's a book about life, love, drama, being models in a big city. The comic was made to rival the success of Archie and the gang, and that it did. The book was beautifully drawn, and it was this slice of lifestyle that had the readers of the time rabid. And a big part of that was the duo of Stan Lee and Stan G. 
the comic was really involved with its readers, and it had them submit everything from clothing ideas to hairstyles. They also had a really active letters page that was the 50s equivalent of Twitter, egged on by Stan pretending to be Millie and answering questions. No joke, Millie and Clicker broke up in one of the issues, and for several issues afterwards, hundreds of teenage girls flooded the letters page to tell Millie she's making a mistake, her and Clicker should be married, Clicker is the most handsome man in comics, and literally one 14-year-old wrote in and threatened the life of Millie for breaking up with Clicker. When they got back together, the letters pages were pro-Clicker and Millie marrying. To kind of satisfy the readers, Marvel made Millie Annual number 6 in 1967 that had Tony marrying her boyfriend Bert, and then she quit the comics because Tony is a wife now, she doesn't have time for modeling. That's really in there. But that did not stop the fans from asking about Millie and Clicker getting hitched. At the end of the run, the comic went from romance and drama with the cutting humor of Chili mixed in to a more Saturday morning fun humor comic again to rival Archie, and the art shifted from the classic romance look to a fun and vibrant DiCarlo style that Archie Comics is known for. The comic ended in 1973, but 80s Marvel gave Millie her own modeling agency with her niece as the hottest new model. Millie showed up in a few titles, like She-Hulk and Dazzler, and there's a king-size Spider-Man Summer Special number one that has 23 pages where Millie and Patsy are hanging out with Mary Jane Watson, and I personally need to add that to my collection. So, some fun facts about Millie. Stan Lee wrote more Millie the Model than he did Fantastic Four. That's really true. Look that up. The paper doll cutouts that were never printed in the ad pages. They were just printed on the story ones. This was because comic book ads always had a clip out to send away for something. So if you hunt for Millie yourself, make sure the paper dolls are in there or you'll be missing plot. Other pros who worked on Millie the Model were Dan DiCarlo, Denny O'Neill, and Roy Thomas. I know Roy worked on a lot of titles, but it's really funny to me that the dude who introduced the manly Conan the Barbarian is writing comics about Millie on a date with Clicker. Jill Gerald's debuts in issue 47. That's June of 1965. That's before Black Panther, Falcon, Storm, a lot of them. If you can find a Millie 1 through 12, you will see that Clicker's original name was Flicker, but they changed it because a capital L and a capital I would bleed on newsprint to make a capital U. This is a family-friendly show, so I will let you figure that out for yourselves. If you can find issue 107, you can read about Millie working for horror artist Jack Kirby with Millie being scared of him, and it's a really funny story. Millie attended the wedding of Sue and Reed. You can find her in the background. And in 2015, the Secret Wars series had a robot named Mill E that was created as a propaganda bot for none other than Marvel's most handsome villain, Doctor Doom. I highly recommend picking up Millie if you find her back issue diving. The artwork and the stories are really enjoyable, and the letters pages are insane, and you can really see if Clicker is the most handsome man in comics. Join me next week, and we'll go back to some Lois Lane. Thank you very much, Becky. This is what the segment was always supposed to be about. Yes, of course, it's focused on Lois Lane because she's the most ridiculous of all these characters and types of Mm -hmm. comics. Uh, But that Millie the Model stuff is, like, fascinating to me. There was a lot of information packed into that segment, but I love the clicker flicker thing. Yes. That made me laugh. At first, I thought it was going to be like some lawsuit with my friend Flicka, but then, you know, like my friend Clicka, but I was like, no, something different. But uh, yeah, that was all absolutely fascinating. And as this episode drops, Joe, wish young Becky a happy birthday. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe around 47. I don't know. But it's it's her birthday as this episode drops. What? No, she's not 47. Oh, my God. But it definitely is her birthday. She well, gets so mad. So mad. So mad when people acknowledge your birthday or so mad when you claim that she's double the age that she probably is? Um, I'm going to go with uh, <laughs> when I do the, like, how, what a half and a little bit more of her age is. Right. And I, I am not a birthday person, but that does not mean you, the royal you, are not a birthday person. So happy birthday, Becky. If I see you at the shop tomorrow, I'll give you uh, a, a be- happy birthday greeting in person as well. Yeah, I look forward to my nasty text. <laughs> so, uh, again, thank you very much again, Becky, for that. And uh, let's get into what we read from this past week, Todd. Where would you like to begin? 
Uh, I'm going to begin with the book I was looking forward to most, which is Rogues Number no. One from Scout Europe Comics, um, a, written by El Torres and art by Pablo M. Collar. Uh, basically, this is a, a sword and sorcery barbarian book, you know, swords and sandals, if you will. The two characters are uh, the big guy is uh, Bram, and his uh, his uh, not sidekick, his partner is Weasel, a young lady. And they basically just have adventures. They're mercenaries, cutthroat, whatever you want to call them. They go do these things. And this one is, you know, supposedly a jumping on point for a one of 24 issue run, whether they're one shots or ongoings. I'm not 100% sure. Um, But this basically tells the story of Bram and Weasel working for this witch to take down uh, this apprentice witch to take down the witch uh, that she's an apprentice to. They end up doing it. um, And uh, some things go sideways that they get cursed. Uh, before they can finish the job and this apprentice which says well you were cursed um by the the like these gods look behind you and there's these three big heads behind them which is funny and they're like that's so and so so and so and so and so they've taken bits of your soul and put them in a cube and took the size and put it throughout your history you know if you don't mind me not paying you i could help you because they never get paid they always get the shaft uh, I could send you through time to pick up these pieces so they won't devour your souls. And through that, they go and they go to different points in time of the book that we, the past issues that as a reader I've read. So it's like, oh, we did this and we did that. And it's like, okay, that's the Cold Ship miniseries. That's the Burning Heart miniseries. This is the, you know, the, the where they get cursed by the chicken and everything like that. And it's all a blast. And the running gag is like, between miniseries, like they would just not acknowledge things that happened and be like, oh, okay, we're back here when we had this house that we lost between, you know, miniseries. And so they just say, we lost somehow. And they do all these bits because they don't like necessarily follow continuity a lot. So I had a blast with that. And then when it's over, we end up seeing they mention a big bad. And, you know, that's probably going to be the big bad that rolls over this thing. But it was a, it's, it's a blast. I kind of equate it to like a quirky fun. I don't want to say like, like justice league international or like superior foes of Spider-Man that, cause that's a high bar, but that kind of like world, but in, uh, swords and sandals and magic and everything like that. And I, as a fan of rogues, thoroughly enjoyed it, had a blast. Um, uh, I, I recommend it to anybody who's into that kind of humor or Conan, like humorous Conan stuff. Right. And, and I'll say this, you know, I remember when you had initially picked this up or stumbled upon this book many, many moons ago and we had discussed it and I think we both read it and I know it's changed publishers. Yes, it was under Amigo and now it's Scout Europe. Right. Uh, which is part of Scout Comics and so on and so forth. Uh, all of that being said, um, definitely keep your eyes on this one. I really enjoyed this. You really did a good job of selling me, just looking at the art on this. Um, in the past, was El Torres both the writer and artist, or is he now just the writer on this? I believe he was always the at least the writer, and he might be the guy who owns who like owns the rights to the character. Like, and at one point was Amigo. I'm not sure on all that, but it was him. And they had various artists uh, throughout the mini series. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like I said, this is definitely one if you're interested in, I'm saying this to you as well. Uh, Todd, keep your eyes peeled because as I just pulled up the December and January previews catalogs, mm-hmm. it's not in the solicitations there. Yeah, I think there's going to be gaps between the issues i'm not sure when they like i haven't seen anything on the next one but that was the only downfall to me with the rogues comics over the years was sometimes they didn't hit a schedule yeah but, in 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 and an infrequent publishing schedule yes yes but in the end i always really liked it so i would stick around if that makes any sense so mm-hmm Uh, so the book I was most looking forward to coming out this past week was Cobra Commander Number no. One, uh, written by Joshua Williamson, who's currently writing Superman over at DC, with art by Andrea Milana. Uh, now, when the Energon universe kicked off, I said to myself, "Self, 
you're not going to get sucked in all these books. You're going to look at the creative teams. Do I need to be buying G.I. Joe and Transformers comics again? And I skipped on the new G.I. Joe series. And I skipped on the Duke series. And I've really been enjoying Superman. And I'm a sucker for the bad guys, right? And I love Cobra Commander. And the the lore in this issue is so perfect. Because we talk about the Transformers that's written by Daniel Warren Johnson. And I feel that the current image book is a mix of the cartoons and the comics of the Marvel 80s stuff in, like, the best way possible. With a little bit of professional wrestling thrown in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whereas this is, and again, I don't usually swear, I don't be, <laughs> but I am going to, this is my one for the year. Uh, this is the most specific, not just cartoon, but G.I. Joe the movie ass comic of all time. <laughs> um, I would agree. I would agree. <laughs> so we get a retail. And this is one of those things where as a kid who grew up playing with G.I. Joes and collecting G.I. Joes and watching the cartoons and reading the comics and the whole thing, right? You know, Cobra Commander's origin story was this, right? You know, he was a failed use car salesman and then like all these other things. And then he gets involved. Like you can't say in a kid's show or a toy line that he gets involved in like a pyramid scheme, which ends right. up being a cult, which ends up being this, 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 right? Right. You're not going to mention in the kids thing, but this terrorist organization. Right. Well, they do say it's a terror, terrorist organization determined on ruling the world. But when the G.I. Joe movie comes out, they decide to pivot <laughs> Cobra Commander's origin that he is a living snake man who is the representative of Cobra Law a race of evil snake men that have lived under the Earth's core for 48,000 years. Oh, you mean the Denver airport? <laughs> so this is that. This is Cobra Commander as part of Cobra Law. Uh, he's a scientist. He's got something locked up. And if you read Transformers and, you know, if you got the spoiler cover, you know who it is. But I'm not going to be the one uh, to tell you all of these things. Um, but there is a breach and maybe Cobra Commander is attempting to um, make the breach more into a riot by inciting people. Um, he gets kind of beaten up during the course of it. And Galobulus is in this. Galobulus, voiced by Burgess Meredith from the movie, is in this. Right. So in your head is Burgess Meredith. Of course. Of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and... It was one of those things where Cobra Commander gets a little beaten up in the in the fracas. Uh, Galobulus, quote, heals Cobra Commander back up so that he can watch him die before his very eyes. And I'm like, again, th- there's like a level of evil of Cobra Commander. And then there's like a higher level of evil. And like that's a great way to put that over. Uh, Cobra Commander, the slippery snake man that he is, and I don't mean Randy Orton, but the original snake man, uh, he's able to sn- s- like talk his way out of it because of what's in the vault and everything else like that. And without giving away what's in the vault, maybe whatever's in the vault kind of knows what Cobra Commander is up to and is just waiting for the moment to double cross him. So there's nothing better than two slimy, slippery, evil people trying to manipulate each other. And now that Cobra Commander is among the real world, he's he's getting some assistance from some folks, unnamed people. And uh, they suggest, like, oh, you know, shouldn't you, like, kind of downplay your whole, like, I'm a scary snake man thing? And he's like, no, I want to flaunt it in front of everyone's face so when we take them over, they know it was me. And I'm just like, oh, that's a level of villainy that I could so respect, right? Right. And then I'm not giving away that, but then at the end of the issue, it's revealed who uh, uh, Cobra Commander's current Earth assisting folks are. (laughs) And I'm just like, oh, this is like everything that I love about G.I. Joe is in this comic. As long as Duke is okay. um, I don't care if Duke's going to be okay or not. 
Right. Well, you know what? Call me when Sir Pantor shows up, okay? Well, so that's the thing. I don't want to give it away, but I definitely think we're if if we're getting Cobra Law, we're getting Gal- we got Galobulus, we are one million percent getting Serpentor, and we're getting Nemesis Enforcer, okay? Which is the worst name ever for a G.I. Joe character. <laughs> but this was perfect. As someone who grew up on this stuff, someone who unabashedly loves all this stuff, like right. they could have shied away from all that stuff. They're like, oh, we don't want to look at all the hokey snake men thing. And Joshua Williams is like, nope, we're tripling down on the snake men. I'm going to say I'm revoking your podcast card for not saying this is no! perfect. This you got to put you got to put the hisses in there, man. Um <laughs> That being said, I was never a G.I. Joe movie guy. Mm. I saw it. That was probably more towards the end of my – I definitely didn't have the toys and stuff. So I was like, ah, not, not, not big on it. I, I enjoyed this. Not as much as you because this is the, perf- the perfect comic for Joe. Um, me, it just seems like, yes, and it's – as I touch on these uh, Energon Universe books, I feel like the – and this isn't a knock. The universe is getting too big too fast for me. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm i like you. I'm probably going to pick and choose what what I would read. Like if they do a Starscream straight up solo, I'm buying that. You know what I mean? Like it's it's that kind of thing. But Cobra Commander was never really my guy. But I enjoyed. I enjoyed this miniseries. If you're a G.I. Joe fan, I think you'll enjoy it too. But I'm more into – the 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 last page that like that if i have a gi joe group that's my group so maybe right. i'll keep going we'll see oh, todd yeah, I, felt, I felt so good when they showed up <sighs> you need to calm down son there's there's more issues to go <laughs> so i will just say this in the little write-up um you know for the cobra commander solicitations um it says, uh, blah, 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 blah. This is the kick off the second of four action packed miniseries that will introduce the best and worst humanity has to offer in the Energon universe. So we already got a Duke, Duke miniseries. We got a Cobra Commander miniseries. I don't know who those other two miniseries is going to be. I assume it's probably going to be one goodie and one baddie. Maybe it's a group. Maybe it's a group of baddies. I'm going to say, and I'm calling my shots here, the kids like the Snake Eyes. Yeah. So we'll probably get a Snake Eyes one shot. He'll be your baby face, sure. He'll be your baby face. I don't think you're getting Sepantor right out of the gate. No. You're getting Destro, which by proxy gets you the face of the G.I. Joe universe Baroness. Uh, The face? The face. Uh, yeah, I like Destro, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll just say, I, I hope that they're all successful and they're like, yeah, we're going to do a bunch of miniseries, this is, this is, this is, right? Right. Uh, Until Joe's like, my wallet can't take it. I can't <laughs> anymore. I can't take my 17th Zartan miniseries. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say... Um, creative teams notwithstanding, I probably would only buy the bad guy GI like the Cobra right. and Cobra adjacent miniseries, right? Right. But based on everything that's happened, it's the Energon universe. All these people are going to cross over. Todd, that moment in this book, and Starscream and Cobra Commander share airspace. Oh my God! Why do we sound alike? <laughs> and I can see you like ten months. Well, I like down the, the road. cut of your jib. Oh, I like the cut of your jib. Let's backstab our groups, like, you know, t- together, and then we'll turn on each other down the road. No, but, we uh, can turn on each other, but we'll secretly turn on each other. Yes, exactly. They both have inner monologues that are exactly the same. When yes. you least expect it, I shall strike. <laughs> um, but I and they do the bit where it's both of them. It's like just one word balloon. Right, it's but like two both. lines to each of them. <laughs> But uh, I look forward to, like, in a year when it gets out of control, you once again going, did we really need a Tomax and a Zayma miniseries? Could they just put them in one? Well, it's a 
It's a flip book, Todd. The first part is Tomax and the second part is Zaymon. All right. They both like, you know, cross over throughout the issue as they both get hurt, you know, because they share the pain. And if you All hold right. the to- if you hold the Tomax issue up to the mirror, it's really the Zaymon issue. I listen. I've, I've already submitted my packet, Todd. Right, your pitch for the Tomax and Zaymon yes. flip book. I'll say this of all the stuff that G.I. Joe did. I thought, as you know, a younger person, that the the idea behind Tomax and Zaymot, all of it, was the most brilliant thing that I've ever seen. Nothing was going to top it until like I hadn't read Watchmen yet. So, Tomax and Zaymot was the pinnacle of like clever writing in comics and cartoons. <laughs> and listen, as much as I have a fondness for this stuff, and of course it's because I grew up with it, and I'm looking at it all with rose-colored glasses, but the creative leap between Tomax and Zaymont and Watchmen is a country mile. What? They're both they're both genius ideas, Joe. Genius ideas. I hang on. I'm gonna send this pitch of. To, I'm gonna send my. I'm gonna unsend this email that I sent to uh, Eric, whatever his name is, who runs Image, and I'm gonna see if I can get Alan Moore to write a Tomax and Zaymon story. Oh my God! <laughs> I have this idea for Tomax and Zaymon. What That's if what they're I mean. wizards who live in a cave? Oh. Mm, they they worship the snake god, so it works. It does. Because doesn't Alan Moore worship a snake god? I'm pretty yeah. sure. I think he just worships a random snake. Not mm. even a snake. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, so the other book uh, from this past <laughs> week was, ah, we're having fun, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and the other book that Todd and I both read from this past week was Avengers Twilight Number 1, written by Chip Zdarsky with art by Daniel Akua, Akuna. I apologize for mispronouncing that. Uh, but this is... A future tale, an alternate reality tale, something uh, where the Avengers are technically no more. Uh, our lead character is Captain America. Um, whatever happened caused him to no longer have the super soldier serum. Uh, but he definitely, you know, is an older man and that is helping keep him alive. After a failed senatorial run... And Hero Day, a.k.a. H-Day, in Boston, the Watcher Act was passed, which is worldwide curfews, uh, bans on superheroes, all this sort of stuff. But all it takes is one documentary commercial to uh, energize, if you will, Captain America to finally do something. Right. When when this uh, commercial tries to put over somebody Cap don't like, he's he'll have no more of it, Joe. Right. I, and it, listen, I got no problem, because again, it's not the main plot of things, but it was a very interesting, like, you know, and again, we're not told when and where this takes place in the future, but it, it's supposed to take place in a future, right? Mm-hmm. But a commercial comes up, and the commercial is for a documentary that's about to air that essentially is Red Skull. Was he really that bad? Mm, they, you know, <laughs> the winners rewrote history, Joe. Eh. And when when Steve goes off, it's like, you know, they're in the commercial. Like, well, he tried to kill Hitler. Yeah, because he wanted to take over. Like, he's, he's, <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say Star Scream and uh, Cobra Commander ain't as bad as Red Skull. But that's what he was doing, you know? So it's a great little bit. And I like like kind of where it goes. And I'm 99% sure because they show uh, Tony Stark's kid in this, which is interesting. Yeah, and Jimmy has, Stark. Right. And he Jimmy. has <laughs> he has a butler that's not a butler who's Jarvis's uh, uh, brother or cousin or something like that. But I swear to God, they, they made him uh, look like uh, Jim Steranko as far as I was concerned. Oh, you think so? That he is drawn as Jim Steranko. A younger Jim Steranko, but Jim Steranko nonetheless. I was going to say, are we allowed to... I guess Jim Steranko gave up on getting that forward. (laughs) I think he did. I think he did, too. Uh, Again, I don't know if I... Let me look. I'm pulling up my digital copy that I had to fight very hard to get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Um, but yeah, so I guess you could say that at the very front of this, the antagonist is Jimmy Stark. Um, I have a feeling that we are going to get a bunch more of the um, old Avengers, and I say old, of course, um, because again, if you know, we, we we get to see Matt Murdock in this, we get to see Luke Cage in this. Um, is it a spoiler for me to say that we get to see Tony Stark in this? Oh, you get to see some of Tony Stark. You get to see the most important part of Tony Stark, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to find the bit with Jimmy uh, as I'm flipping through the pages here. It's early on. Did they make him look like Steranko? So I, so I'm going to disagree with you and say, unless this was the intent there as well, that they are trying to make him look like um, Vic Sage when, like, an older version of Vic Sage when Vision would adopt a human reality. Okay. I could kind of see what you're saying there. What if, you know, they say it's not Jarvis, but it is Jarvis, and, like, you get that little bit of from the movie, like, the Jarvis um, protocol that this is Vision? Could be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you and uh, um, bringing up the name of Starenko that makes me think that that's who it is. Uh, but what did you think of this? I know you were on the fence about picking this up, what have you. You got talked into it. Yes, young uh, Joshua was like he, it's an old man book so you kind of have to you kind of have to read it uh so i tried it and i enjoyed it i like i i'm a sucker for any like alternate universe or alternate future storyline mm-hmm. a la king i'm not going to com- can compare it to kingdom come but you get what i'm saying that or or whatever so yeah i enjoy i want to see where it goes um i like cap in it where cap will stand up to bullies even if he ain't you know at the mo- his most powerful kind of kind of bit um i'm, I'm not gonna say i love the book but i really really liked it but i'm gonna see where this where, where it goes from here so I like this actually quite a bit. Um, I, I, you know, I think Chip Zdarsky's superhero stuff is some of his strongest stuff. Uh, the fact that he's writing big stuff at both Marvel and DC currently is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. The fact that he's writing the Batman book. And I'm sure this will do good numbers because it's a very well-made comic. But the one thing that I wanted to focus on and discuss was Daniel Acuna's art. Mm-hmm. I like Daniel Acuna's art very much. And I thought this was some of his best art I've ever seen. I, I'm i with you on that because uh, Kuna sometimes doesn't work for what I'm reading. Like he has a style that doesn't always work for what it is. Um, for this, it definitely did. And it seemed like he's gotten, you know, like he's amazing right now. I should have had it. Like I said, I, I, I should have did a better job as I was looking everything up here with the uh, creative team on this, if you will. And I literally just had it in my fingertips and now it's gone like a dummy. Um, okay. So he is the, uh, Akuna is uh, doing the pencils, the inks and the coloring on this, right? Mm-hmm. There is stuff. And the thing that always comes to mind is that run on green lantern that Akuna did. And I okay. remember it very much. It was like a star Sapphire story. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember if he did the pencils, the inks, and the coloring on that as well. But he used a much softer ink line. And a like light, like lighter coloring, like a like a like a softer palette for colors too. That was all him. Like okay. when he did that. Yeah. It didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. It, he greens, did that on Flash and it didn't work for me. Yeah, okay. There's Flash too. Um but this has a deeper, a richer you know, it's still your reds, it's still your blues, but everything's just a little bit darker. It's mm-hmm. got a heavier ink line on a lot of the stuff. And, and I definitely think, I, you know, far be it from me to tell Daniel Acuna how to do his stuff, but I, I definitely see a difference between the Green Lantern stuff and the Flash stuff and this stuff. Right. And um, I like this and, stuff better. And I'll say one last look on Jervis's relative, Joe. Yes. Do you know who Walton Goggins is? The name sounds familiar, but no. He's an actor. Google Walton Goggins Righteous Gemstones, and you'll see. There you go. He, like, to me, that's 
he, this uh, uh, Daniel drawing him from Righteous Gemstones, and Walter Goggins, Walton Goggins took his look from Sturenko. So it's like that five, six degrees of bacon, as far as I'm concerned. I feel as though a lot of people lift that. Um, I I think in uh, Eastbound and Down, Mm -hmm. uh, Will Ferrell did a similar look to that. Right. And people have associated that that's less a Jim Steranko and more an aping of a Ric Flair style. Stop it. I'm just saying. I, if, if you're going to, if, if that style is anybody's, it's mm-hmm. Jim Steranko's, not, you know, Mr. Plane Ride, you know? Yeah. Fla- well, anyway. Al- I think it's just best for us to say allegedly and move on. How about that? Allegedly. Allegedly. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Check out Avengers Twilight. I liked it. Check out Cobra Commander if you're a kid of the 80s and, uh, you know, keep your eyes peeled for. Uh, rogues yep when it comes out we'll do our best uh because i remember enjoying it when todd was getting it before now he's back let's enjoy it together uh <laughs> let's also enjoy what we're most looking forward to coming out this week if you head over to longboxheroes.com every tuesday around noon eastern time we put up the pull post which is a link to a link to all the books that are coming out this week whether you get your books in print whether you get them digitally whether you get them sent to your home whether you're sending somebody else in the store to buy your mature uh, <laughs> rated titles. Be forewarned, be forearmed, know what's coming out this week. Todd and I attempt to guess what the other is most looking forward to coming out this week. Todd is currently in the lead over me with one correct guess. It's still anyone's ball game. It's just like the regular season for baseball. The first 150 games don't matter until we get to the final like 10. Mm-hmm. I agree. So I'm looking over your list. And is the book you're looking forward to most Brave, Batman Brave and the Bold number nine? It is uh, Batman Brave and the Bold number nine. And I think that is the book that you are also most looking forward to coming out this week. It is. No movement once again, Joe. Right, right. Um, yep. This is the wrap up of the uh, Kyle Stark's story involving um, Wild Dog. And hopefully we got more. <laughs> Coming out from Kyle Starks, from Marvel, DC, what have you. Hopefully we get an announcement on the Where Monsters Lie sequel, something, something. Uh, But, you know, this is one of those ones where I have no idea how this Batman Brave and the Bold is being collected. If it is being collected, how it's being collected, whatever. But this is one that, you know, I I definitely would have much preferred for my pocketbook just to have been released as like one, like 48 page special. And I would have picked it up. But I get it's a little bit more difficult to sell a wild dog book if it don't have Batman's name on the book. But I'm still buying it anyway. I have a feeling in the future it's going to be easier to sell a smaller character with Kyle Starks writing it. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, So while you're over at longboxheroes.com, be sure to check out all the other stuff that Todd and I are up to. Uh, Buy some of these shirts and pins and stickers that I got sitting here. I don't know. I might cut price them just to get them out of the office. I cleaned up the office this weekend. Nice. Yeah. It's like I feel like I got like (laughs) – I feel like I picked up like uh, four square feet of extra living space in here. Right now you could fill it in with uh, Bib Fortuna figures and Eddie Kingston figures. That's I right. can't tell which one is which sometimes, but, you know. How dare you? What? Did um, Bib Fortuna come with a gas can? No, he did not come with a gas this? can. He came with, like, a giant, like, thing of frogs or something that he feeds to Jabba. Right. Uh, no tea. Uh, is it tea public sale this weekend? Mm. Uh, yeah, tea public sale is this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, 35% off. Uh, all the designs inspired by this show, After Dark, Soon to Be Named Network, Final Wrestling Place, etc. You can get shirts and cell phone covers and notebooks and all sorts of jazz uh, like that. Um, but also the other thing, of course, while you're checking out longboxyears.com, is the current ongoing Todd and Joe Have Issues as we are rereading Gail Simone's Secret Six. But of course, to get there, we need to read Villains United first. And we are currently on issue four of Villains United. Uh, I am glad to see that Dale Eaglesham is back, and I am still surprised to see the Countdown to Infinite Crisis still on the cover. They were on the mall, Joe. Yes. 
But what a cover, though. Look at that. It's a great, it's a, it's a beautiful cover. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we get the crew, the six, still just called the six, not a secret six just yet. Uh, they are uh, headed to Bolivia to take out one of the society's power sources. And the six have their alternate. Uh, if they were Fortnite characters, this would be their, like, B skin. If they were video game characters, this would be the unlockable skin. If they were toys, this would be the 1 in 20 variants of their figures. This is their nighttime away jerseys, Joe. <laughs> yes. So it's not definitive cloaking stuff, but it just messes with the cloaking. So, like... Um, they just, it, it baffles the sensors. It doesn't completely hide them. So it is going to give them some cover, but not a lot of cover. Mm-hmm. Um, this is also the first time that we see scandal completely geared up. Right. Uh, for the mission. And she looks awesome. Geared up. Fantastic look. And mm-hmm. I think this is a Gail Simone creation, right? Yes. Her first appearance, I believe was in villains United number one. Yeah, uh, but this is the first appearance of her, quote-unquote, in costume. Uh, we still don't have the reveal of who she is, even though I blew that here on the show four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least in book, they haven't revealed who it is, right? Yep, yep. Um, they know that the Six are out there attempting to take out one of their power sources, so they need to get Black Adam on the job. Uh, they do have a room full of some morts. Mm-hmm. Um, that are getting ready to be teamed up with him, and apparently they end up uh, going a different route, which is teased at the beginning of the book, which is the new Royal Flush Gang. More on them later, and my feelings on them. Right. Um, to infiltrate the headquarters, uh, a, a f- I would say the best moment in this issue uh, is Ragdoll using, I'll say, their um, quadruple jointedness. Mm-hmm. To crawl down a sewer pipe and up through a toilet. Mm-hmm. And as they're doing so, um, they are very proud of this, saying that this this will be my masterpiece. Um, you know, obviously wanting to be like the father and like the brother that they never were, uh, being able to fit into these sort of tighter spaces, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, the lower end goons of Luther's group is the Hive, and you've got the Queen Bee. I like the design of the Queen Bee. It's very rare that we get to see that. Like, I think one of the first times that we got to see the Queen Bee of the Hive goons was like, at least in my, uh, was one of the early Giffen Dematti's JLI books. Right. And Bi- uh, Bi- Bi- Alia was she was in charge of that for a little bit. Yes, yes. Uh, So she was Queen Bee. Whether or not that's the same Queen Bee, I'm going to guess not. Mm -hmm. Uh, They do a good bit in getting over how capable Scandal is, uh, able to kind of hold her own. Um, Black Adam. Go ahead. One of my favorite bits is when they show up, obviously, uh, Ragdoll lets them in through the turlet entrance. And I love that Catman standing there in the all blacks, the black jersey, the Raiders jersey. And he's like, evening i'd like you to all meet my backup and he does the backflip over deadshot and deadshot just mows everybody down one of my favorite visuals in this book because it's like oh man like all right Catman, all right we could survive oh deadshot i'm dead kind of a deal it's just instantaneous and looks beautiful Mm -hmm. uh we also get a little bit more of well well, okay so we'll get to that a little bit later on but we find out what the society's plan is Mm -hmm. uh, with all these big power sources are is that they're going to mind wipe all the superheroes right and therefore they'll be able to just kind of take things over and Catman's like well no we can't let them do this and Deadshot's like sure whatever um and they're having a back and forth in regards to this um, and that allows, you know, it, that is interrupted as Parademon thinks from their previous infiltration that Ragdoll has been killed, uh, but they were just shot in the collarbone, which they were planning on replacing anyway. Um, Black Adam shows up with the, the new Royal Flush Gang, and it's revealed what the society had been using as the power source for this location. 
um, which was Firestorm. And right. under the cover of Firestorm, kind of lightened them up. Uh, the six are able to get away, get back to the House of Secrets. Now, we get a little bit, because it was teased earlier in the issue, um, a little bit more of Catman's past. As they're not so much as attempting to retcon, but attempting to fix. To make it make sense. To make it make sense, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the stories is that Deadshot pokes him, saying that you got eaten by a monkey. Right, which was Monsieur Mala or something. Right, and again, not a monkey, but a gorilla. Um, And, you know, Catman has a whole thing um, saying that he technically wasn't eaten. He's like, I was there. I'm not sure how much of any of this is true. Uh, He says that I was more swallowed by a metaphor and digested by self-loathing, which is, Mm. and again, to continue off of that, when a Frenchman and an ape think you're not even worth killing, that's a bit of a dark day. And he kind of cites that as the beginning of his descent into being a bum. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and kind of how he's been turning his life around. We also get a bit where they bring up Cheshire nuking the town, which you had mentioned last week. Mm-hmm. And then Catman's like, how do we know that she really did that? Right. And it's their way of attempting to kind of, and I hate to say baby face, but kind of like change her narrative as well. Right. She didn't kill a, a two million people in an instant, maybe. Yes. Um, and, you I, know, we get, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I like to, we get the bit where he tells the story of the, like, you know, because we didn't see it. We only saw it off camera where Deathstroke comes and kills his pride of lions. But I like when he went to live in the, to, to reboot his life, he went to live in the, the jungle or the, the, the plains with the lions. And we see how he gets the scar on his chest from the mm-hmm. lion attacking him. And it's really cool to see him like go up to that and then see like him broken from Deathstroke murdering them all. Now, if, well, again, I don't want to get too far into this, right? Mm-hmm. But again, we get like a good bit of the soliloquy in that Catman says, I decided to murder my old life to break its neck in Africa, which is, a, you know, a great line, right? Mm-hmm. And he, he mentions that there are clues that he's aware that Deathstroke is the one that came to his camp and killed the pride of lions that he was with. Right. And I think we get a bit of, oh, yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, so there was the the distraction that he thought was poachers that led him away, and then that's when Deathstroke came in. And I think we get a reveal about that a little bit later on in the series, and again, later on, we got two issues left, right? Right. Um, and we get the bit at the end as to why Cheshire has kind of uh, taken her way to uh, Catman. Um, you know, she feels as though he's attempting to be a good guy. She maybe even accuses him of being a spy. And, uh, the reason that she chose to <clears throat> be with Catman <laughs> is that she, um, you know, obviously we get, we learn, you know, obviously it's very clear of the group. He's the alpha male of the group and she wanted to, uh, have, uh, his genetic material to, to be a mom again. Yes. Because you know who her kid is with, right? She has a kid with? Right, with uh, Arsenal, Connor Hawk. Not uh, Roy Harper. Roy Harper, Roy Harper, Roy Harper yeah. Roy Harper. This was before they killed the kid, but... Yeah. And then brought her back, but... Now, you were saying something about the Royal Flush Gang, because there's something I want to touch on at the beginning yeah. of the series. Go ahead. Uh, the, uh, the issue. Like, because basically Jack of the Royal Flush Gang, he's in jail and he goes to see the warden, and he tells, he tells the warden the story of the society. And he's like, and there's going to come a day where you're going to let you're you're going to let me out today, and there's going to be a day where you let everybody out of this prison and every other warden takes out because he basically blackmails them. He says like, I know where you know where your kid sleeps and describes the room. It's real creepy and it's really good. And he ends up saying the difference between us and them is you know they they had a police force. They're united. We don't band together very well. So we're doing a society. And there's this really cool bit where he does the gang sign, the S for society. And I don't think they do that for long because obviously the society doesn't stay together forever. But the fact that like the society has a gang sign, I pop for. And I don't know what you're going to say about the Royal Flesh Gang, but 
the Royal Flush Gang are great. Play school's my first villain for any superhero who shows up on on the thing. He was Booster Gold's first villain. He was this like they are run through them real easy villains, and I love the Royal Flush Gang. I love them for that as well. I hate the redesign of them in this issue. You see it maybe on three panels. I oh. like the bit at the beginning where what is it? Deuce had become Ace. Right. Or Deuce had become Jack. Jack. So he became one-eyed Jack, Joe. Yeah. Um, I hate the thug, hip-hop modernization of the Royal Flush Gang. If we're not like playing cards. If we're not all in spandex suits and we look like playing cards, are we really the Royal Flush Gang? No, we're not. No? So that's, you know, we're four issues in and that's the only complaint i guess i would have and I, I'm, I'm almost certain that this redesign does not last very long um the royal flesh gang are like the the epitome of the jobber team that comes in to get the new guy over or the new mm-hmm. team over i love it um but this is a good issue this has been great stuff love re-reading all of this stuff hopefully you're rereading it with us as well you know i have the reading stuff um with this once we get past the villains united special in five six seven three weeks um you know everything else there's like two or three or four different ways that you could read everything it's just at this point that you know that villains united special is only collected in one spot right yeah uh but i thought this was great um you know uh, yeah i i really enjoy rereading all this stuff Big fan of the Secret Six, Joe. Yeah. I mixed up the plugs a little bit there. I threw in the stuff about like where you could support us, but I wanted to sit off and wait off and mentioning the Patreon, of course. Mm-hmm. Patreon.com slash Longbox Heroes. For as little as a dollar a month, you're going to get two bonus shows from Todd and myself. Uh, you're going to get uh, Previewing the Past, where we look at 30 years ago this month's previews catalog, and Comic Book Oddities, where we look at some of the lesser known, more forgotten, older comic book attempts, movies, TV movies. That's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Uh, we're going to be recording uh, February, proving the past year in a couple weeks, ni- February 1994. We're hot off the heels of recording Return of the Incredible Hulk uh, with one of the uh, greatest pieces of lost media ever hmm. in the history of history. Right. You got to explain that with a certain amount of words, Joe. Mm. One, uh, 150 or more. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you sign up, uh, you also get um, the scans of those previews that we're talking about going all the way back to 1990 when we started doing the show. Um, you know, four years now that we've been doing this. The pre- oh, my past. God. I know. It's crazy. I sit there and I think I remember the origin of it, you know, seeing that um, April 1990 previews catalog with the McFarlane Spider-Man going for so much money. And, and like then think, the spawn one and the spawn one and just thinking to myself, like, what if, what if we went and we looked back at these sort of things? Like I was I, the same way. What if, yeah. there were, what if we else world yeah. and did, what if is so much better, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it seems like, you know, forever ago that we started this. Right. Uh, and you know, like I said, go look back through those previous catalogs, go listen to the podcast, $5 a month. It's going to get you those two bonus shows. Uh, two weeks before everyone else, and you're going to get uh, at After Dark two days before everyone else. So you can listen to the shows in the correct listening order. And also, any level is going to get you access to the soon-to-be-named Network Discord, where there's all sorts of discussions on all the topics and more that are covered uh, here on the shows on the network and so on. Yep. Uh, and I think that's it, because again, you said there's no TV shows or there's no movies or nothing like that, right? Right, you never watched Echo, right? No, I didn't watch Echo. Right? I don't see you getting around to Echo, no. but yeah, I don't think there's anything on the slate till uh, Madam Web, and I fall okay. down those steps. Okay, well, uh, listen, everybody, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this was episode uh, four nine or six ninety four of Longbox Heroes for Todd. This is Joe saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you all here next week. Remember, be a faucet, not a drain.
You're listening to the soon-to-be-named network, the Lamborghini of Podcast Networks. The Rob is a long box hero. The Rob is a long box hero. He gives us five five stars. Now, I'm putting this after everything. I didn't forget about the thing that I wanted to talk about, but I want to put it at the very, very end, okay? Okay. Okay. As a riv, <laughs> what if we start recommending bad comics for Brett to read? Oh. Oh. I think you're going to love One More Day. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're going to love that one where there's fast aging ninjas. Oh, it's, it's one of my favorite Spider-Man stories. It really... Like I really like I know DJ is gonna recommend to him the Frankencastle book, but <laughs> oh, jeez. But there's bad stuff out there. Like what was the ultimate? Um, not all. It was like the ultimate book that kind of killed the ultimate universe. That's a like, wide uh, net there, Joe. No, it was a mini series that called like Ultimate Fallout or something. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. like there's a bunch of notoriously bad comic book stories. Mm-hmm. Um, like no, you don't need to read fifty two, but you really need to read Countdown. Oh, that's yes, like, <laughs> that's fifty two done right. Right, right. Well, like obviously we need to do this in a way that like everybody else is smartened up to it. Yeah, because everybody like, what the heck are you giving them Sleepwalker for? No, Sleepwalker is all right. It's no, not I'm bad. Um, I'm trying to think but, of bad ones now, so yeah, you just got to think of some bad comics. It just as a rib because we're only going to get like one or two, you know. Right. That's you know the that's that's Ricky. Oh, the story of Ricky. Right. How that's dare how, you? That's how you get them. You fool them with one, and then you don't fall for that no more. Yeah. I don't know. So uh, hopefully Brett has tuned out by now, mm-hmm. and uh, you're still listening you not brett and you could recommend to us some bad comic book stories so we could recommend them to our friend brett as a rib right secretly not you know secretly, out on yes. main not out on main you know uh direct messages on oh. the uh long box heroes twitter yeah. account stuff like a- not, even like frank castle but angel punisher remember that yes. one yes yes oh, good but stuff the, it was it was the batman widening guyer that made me think of it oh. like a notoriously poorly received badly written just bad 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 all across batman right. story. you know what crossover you're gonna love bloodlines oh the whole thing sit down and don't stop you'll get there don't you worry <laughs> yes it's yes it's 52 annuals but it's worth it <laughs> it's worth oh. it for us to see you go through it yeah, like we can't do like big heavy hitters either. No. Like we could come in here and say like, "Oh, read the Rob's Young Blood," you know, right. read Brigade or something. Just like completely impenetrable, ugly book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to think about this, right? I really don't like. Um, you know, I know. Um, people right off the rip, he liked Dark Knight Returns. Give him the sequel. Right, dark like yeah, DK two. Yeah. Right, Dark Knight Returns, returns as I call it. Yeah, but there is. So remember how Hush was supposed to be Jason Todd, and they chickened out. Yep. And then they did a story after that where they did reveal that Jason Todd was behind it, like trying to retcon it, and it's a really bad story, and everyone ignores it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like stuff like that, like the stuff that happens and is so bad. They just ignored and move on. Oh, there's a good one of and this has to be like late 90s, early 2000s, where they reveal that teenage Tony Stark is really Kang. Right. And that was Kid Kid Iron or something like that. Well, they tried to fix it in Young Avengers. But like the actual story in the Iron Man continuity where they're like, oh, Tony Stark has been a villain this whole time. He's always been Kang. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're like, no, 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 we're never doing that again. And uh, that Alan Heisenberg guy who did the, who started the Young Avengers book, he was the one, he's like, we could fix this story. And he kind of did. But like the Young Avengers went on without 
uh, Iron Kid and Teenage Tony Stark and all those stuff. Like, they all kind of grew from there, you know? Right. Oh, Brett, you really like Watchmen. Have you heard of Before Watchmen? <laughs> I think we've already told him not to read before. Right? Right. He might not remember. You never know. Yeah. All right. Now I'm it. looking through my collection for bad comics that I can lend him. And see, that's the thing. Usually if there's stuff that I get that ends up being bad, I get rid of it. Right. I don't know. We'll have to see. No, we'll just use uh, DJ's collection. Oh, my goodness. What? How, how he, he was at the shop today, right? So we're talking, and he goes... He goes, uh, yeah, he's like, I'm running out of stuff to give him. Because I'm like, here's my entire – and I forget what run he said, but I laughed out loud. He goes, he's, he's not going to like what I'm going to give him after a certain – because I have some high points, but you know my collection. I started laughing. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah, well, we'll just use yours. Now, they say controversial, right? hmm But, again, there's a difference between controversial and bad. Right. Um. I'm just looking this up here. Um, obviously, Sin's Past is up there, right? Right. Um, Avengers: The Crossing, and that's the um, the the jacket era Avengers. Mm-hmm. We mentioned Marvel and the Thing. That's a bad one. Um, but Sin's Past leads to one more day. Both are pretty bad, right? Right. Uh, trouble is already being discussed. Ultimatum. <sighs> Ultimatum. <sighs> Is that uh, the Ultimate Universe storyline? That's really, really bad. Joe, I, I got out. one. I got one. Uh, right. Superman Grounded. Superman Grounded is pretty bad. Where he walks across. And Tony Forsetti, uh, one of my friends, always said, he goes, that storyline, you will believe a man can walk. So terrible. Yeah, but Ultimatum is the one I was thinking of. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Amazon Attacks was pretty bad. Right. That was pretty bad. Uh, not a lot of DC pops up. You know, DC only puts out quality work. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, just trying to I mean, see what else. Uh, you can't trust... Um, oh, so we, you mentioned DK2. All-Star Batman and Robin. Oh! <laughs> um... So not so there's there's a run now listen I know you don't like Grant Morrison but I I will put Grant Morrison's new X-Men um up on the list of readable by the general populace um Grant Morrison stories right Chuck Austin comes in after that run and tries to retcon everything that Grant Morrison did right and it's just a disaster <laughs> yeah, so I've never good. read that. Yeah, Ultimatum comes up on like every list, and that's that. that that's the, that was the thing that ended the, um, the Ultimate Universe for a while, where they had to kind of put it back into mothballs, where it just recently came back in the last like couple months. Um, Heroes in Crisis. That's yeah. That's not other than a few highs. To me, that's like Identity Crisis. Is another one that like has a few high spots. Uh, it, it, they're bad. If I was going to give them one, Final Crisis. Final Crisis, where Superman saves the day by singing the perfect note. That's a good <laughs> that's so that's Grant Morrison off his own uh, hind quarters a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so again, I uh, look to you, uh, listeners. Let us know some bad comic book storylines so we can recommend them. Uh, to our friend as a as a as a funny bit he likes football nfl super pro super pro but i think like you see nfl super pro and like you don't even need to read the comic you're like oh i know this is bad i just look at the comic what? Bad. I read it. right anyway anyway all right everyone thank you again for all your help in advance and uh we'll see you next week <laughs>